Good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Hope you have started an amazing day today. Today, I'm going to go live with a dear friend of us, a shaman, Chapel. So, um, I'm asking everyone to write comments. Let me know where you guys are joining me from. Yes beautiful day good morning good afternoon zore great to have you here so let me know guys what do you know about shamanism what do you think about the shamans have you guys had any experience here did you guys oh vancouver hi shore hello niru from chicago welcome 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 Kapal, my guest is here. Well, wow, what a beautiful day, guys. What a beautiful day. Yes, great to see you here too, Zore. Good day, Kapal. Good day, Sudi. How are um, you? You look radiant. Thank you so much. How is it going down there? Beautiful. Absolutely first class. I'm kind of on holiday, actually, which is really nice. Can you hear me okay? It's a bit windy where I am. I try to find a place that's a bit sheltered so you can you can hear me all right yes it's beautiful where are you right now uh we're on the coast of coast of portugal i live in portugal as you, i think you know and um yeah we came down to the seaside just to have a few days break get some sea and you know fresh air and all the lovely things we get by the coast charge wonderful. up our energy mm -hmm. wonderful yeah so if you're ready let's dive into our topics today Let's do it. Yeah, I'm excited. The nice topic. What are you a smoking chapel? <laughs> I'm not. You know how many people ask me that. It's so funny. It's not a bong. <laughs> it's actually it's it's yerba mate. It's an Argentinian tea that is has been drunk for oh, a long, long time in the Amazon. And um, you you basically pour water onto the herb and then you drink it through the straw. Uh huh. My Argentinian friend would really give me a massive telling off for calling it a straw. It's called a bombisha. It's like a pipe with a filter on the end. It stops all the herb coming up in your mouth. That's fantastic. It's lovely. It's got all the benefits of coffee without any of the nasty side effects. So, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful drink. It keeps me energized, puts energy in my muscles, makes me feel like a god. You know, Great. <laughs> yes. So how do we look at from your point of view how are we looking at shamanism in the new lens or new world ah that's a really good question i think first of all we need to define what shamanism is know what it is and what it isn't and, exactly. and i think it's very helpful to realize that the word shamanism or the word shaman doesn't really mean what we use the word to mean originally shamans were from a particular tribe that lived out in, in Siberia, on the, on the, the tundras there, uh, and they used to live with reindeer, and they, would, they, they, they lived in their indigenous life, and, and the shamans were a tribe of indigenous people who lived out there. And what we call shamans is something a little different to, to them. You know, this was an indigenous tribe of people. What we think of as shamans now is, is kind of like medicine people, people who live kind of on the fringes of society, people who are, have one foot in the spirit world and one foot in the three-dimensional realm. And that's what, that's what people think of mostly, I, I, I believe, when they hear the word shaman. I use the term shaman. I describe my work as shamanic work because people know what I mean. It's a, it's a very convenient word, but it's not the true definition of, of the word shaman. But I think we all agree nowadays what the word shaman means to us. I think it's, you know, when we put that on the table and we accept, okay, this is what it really means and this is what we use the word to mean, we come to a place of agreement and then we can have the discussion as to what, we, what shamans are and what shamans do. So your question was, you know, what, what was shamanism and, and what it is now or what shamans were and what they are now? No, today what, with a new lens, if you want to look at it, because you said this is how when you ask people, but you and I are more in tune with shamanism. So I wanted to know in your point of view, how can we explain 
who shamans are and what is shamanism. Mm. Okay. I don't like to call myself a shaman. I feel like it's a big hat to wear for a guy that was born a Jew in North London, you know, city boy. To call myself a shaman feels a little bit inauthentic on the one hand. And on the other hand, because shamanism really deals with polarities, the work I do is very shamanic. I'm working by, by channeling energy. And, and this is what shamans do. We, we channel energy. And I would say there are two types of shaman, certainly from where I trained. Most of my training was done in the Amazon rainforest. And there, there's definitely two types of shamans. There's what they call a, a brujo, which is a sorcerer, and a curandero, which is a healer. I'm training on the, on the curandero path, the, the path of healing, uh, which to me is the path of evolution. It's the same thing. Healing evolution is the same thing, as far as I can tell. The brujism path is about making deals and contracts with spirits, usually low vibrational astral spirits, who wish to work with us so that we can gain power from them and they can gain energy from us. And this is not a, it's not a good arrangement that I can see. I never see this going well for people. Brujas always end up in a lot of trouble. They end up scared because it's like a war out there and people are always fighting. These brujas are always throwing magic darts at each other. And what these entities want is they're essentially astral parasites and they're like, they want to feed off humans, off our emotional energy and our mental energy. And they want to suck our life force. So they make these deals with these, these, uh, these humans so that the, the humans can lead them to other people in exchange for power. I don't think we should go there. I'm certainly not that kind of shaman. And I don't advocate that kind of shamanism because it's, it's not really spiritual. It's a way of, of manipulating material energy to gain power, to gain energy, essentially. Not, not a great way to go. But the, the shamanism that I like is, is about healing. It's about connecting with energy. For me, it's about connecting. I'm not afraid to use the word God. And when, I, when I'm channeling, I, I, I connect with, with the divine masculine, which I see as energy above, above me, from the, to the center of everything. And I connect with the divine feminine, which is, which is generally seen down, not below as in, in a hierarchy, but, but down, the center of the earth. And I draw upon these two forces, and I channel those two forces through me for the purpose of healing. And this to me is very shamanic, because shamanism is, is very much appreciating the duality of of reality, the divine masculine, divine feminine, the light and the dark, the yin and the yang, whatever names have been ascribed to these two polar forces through the eons. These are the two forces that create life, that create everything in life. So for me, it's about connecting with those two forces and bringing them through me in order to manifest often healing, but also manifesting anything, anything we want to create in this world is a unification of these two forces with our own mind, our own heart. Mm. So this is the way I work shamanically. I'm sure you work in a similar way. Yeah. Um, I was observing everything that you were saying. Um, to me, I think healing, if I can put it this way, it's a little softer way like you're working with someone who is many times physically experiencing um, some pain or uh, experiencing some illnesses or what, what have you. And then uh, maybe emotionally and uh, mentally, they're all kind of in combination. And when we sent the light, it works in a softer way but when i work in when i call myself a shaman the way i do it is for instance you're getting so deep into someone's uh, body that you you have the capability to remove the um, entities like you see that sometimes i had a client i give you the uh, this uh, scenario a couple of days ago 
and she said uh, she has tried many uh, she's been to many ayahuasca journeys and mushrooms and blah blah and when i worked on her she says oh that this experience was just the same as when i was taking ayahuasca and it was removing something and she felt it she said i felt like something left in my body and when she came to me she was like really angry and i said um you feel like you want to hit someone and she laughed and she says oh my god yes i've been so irritated and edgy for the last 3 days and i was at my husband like why is everything was wrong i said what were you complaining why is this and what is this like that and what what is the sunshine coming so she i sensed that she was really on ease she couldn't have a smile over something mm-hmm. was really deeply like an entity that is taking over your soul and then you can't really pinpoint at what is it and where is this anger or upset or whatever but as soon as that entity was removed from her body she was like released she came up and she was happy she started laughing she was smiling and she was like oh my god i feel so light something has left my body so i think the way i look at it maybe the shamanistic work is a more deep rooted like removing entities from someone's uh and then um basically i feel like because i've been doing this now for maybe about 20 years is that once you remove a entity it's like the result is the pleasant result last much longer as we can do a healing which is a softer level and then maybe you can feel better maybe you're not maybe your symptoms kind of shows less but is not removed totally f- from the root you know it can show itself and and uh, it's not so sustainable so in maybe you, it can last for a day or two you feel calmer you feel more relaxed but then again everything arises the anger the upset the illness and uh, so correct me if i'm wrong what do you think about the way i just explained the difference of these two let me see if i understand you right what i feel like you're saying is that um a healing is like a very soft almost like a balm a soothing and making someone feel better um and and kind of alleviating symptoms this kind of thing whereas the shamanic work for you is is going much deeper and it's finding the root cause of something and pulling it out and letting them be free of the of the cause of those things mm-hmm. is that what you're saying yeah but i don't know if you're comfortable with the word uh, entity like sometimes I'm comfortable with the word i may not be comfortable if i had entities but <laughs> Yes, I'm very comfortable with that word. I'm very familiar with it and and I've I've encountered many. I have an interesting take on this. I I appreciate where you're coming from with that. And yes, I feel very much that with the shamanistic work we are called to see these entities and to see where they're infiltrating our field. But I really strongly believe that the person that needs to remove the entity is the one who has them in them in the first place because if i come along to somebody who who has an entity infestation and i take their entity out what i'm often going to do is leave an entity sized shaped hole in their aura that would allow either the same entity back in again or often what is the case is a, a bigger badder entity comes in and fills that space why because the reason the entity were able to come in and penetrate that person's field in the first place is because on some level they allowed it or invited it why would a person do that only because of usually old programs and patterns possibly childhood programs that create sort of beliefs and dependencies and openings that that welcome these spirits to come in it's subconscious it's unconscious nobody really wants to be possessed by another entity but our behaviors allow in some cases 
us to be open to receiving because we're not taught as children how to create and maintain our energetic boundaries. In fact, if anything, the whole structure of society that we live in weakens our system, you know, with, with God, everything, you know, <laughs> with the media, with our, our, our low vibrational food diet, with our, you know, the, the drugs that we're, we're given for, you know, the, wet, the, the, the sickness society, you know, that all the antibiotics, it all weakens our system. The education system that we're, you know, pushed into also weakens our field. Our religions, our spirituality is so watered down in this day and age that our, our field becomes weak. and We become very susceptible to this entity abuse. Our vibration generally as a species appears to be rising because we are entering a new age, the age of Aquarius, where there is greater telepathy, greater openness, greater transparency. But that comes with certain side effects. Our, our veils are thinner and we, we are perhaps more susceptible to these, these entities. But if someone is able to see the entity within them, see the reason for that entity being there, the mechanism that allowed and invited them in, change the behavioral pattern, evict the entity and close up their own field, they're not going to get reinfested. If I come along and remove entities from someone, yes, they will get you know, some relief. And maybe that's the end of the story. But in my experience, usually it's not. Sometime later, they get a reinfestation, either the same entity because they have a relationship with that entity or another one that's often worse. It's kind of like, you know, people who, who are in an abusive relationship. They've allowed the relationship to begin. They've allowed the abuse to persist for, for a certain amount of time. If eventually, as many people do, they leave the abusive relationship they often find themselves either back in the same relationship or in a similar situation with someone else who's just as, if not more, abusive. It's the same thing. It's our own patterns and programs and behavioral conditioning that kind of lead us down these paths to, to create the relationships with those entities. What a shaman can do is see that relationship, see the other half of the relationship, the other, see the entity, and see beyond the mundane every day to the cause of that and help the person to become empowered to clear their field and to overcome the obstacles in their past have gotten to the place where they invite the entities or allow the entities to be in there in the first place. Oh. <clears throat> so I guess I have a slightly different approach. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I hear you. I think... Um... If we are not aware of our energy fields and we kind of block and hold, like I always teach this, I said, always ask Angel Michael the minute when you wake up, ask Angel Michael to surround you and uh, protect your aura and your energy field in order for not allowing other entities to enter your body so if we learn to keep and hold our space and ground ourselves because the majority of time what happens is most people are leaving their body they're not fully embodying and being grounded and holding their space they're just like all over the place when, when people hear about out of body experience most people, they said, how would I do that? How do I get? I said, you're already doing that every day. You're, you're, you're not really fully present in your body. You're all over the place. You're experiencing auto body experience. So I teach people how to ground themselves. Like most people don't know what does yeah. grounding means to really hold your space. So I think that comes with awareness. And as a shaman, when we teach people that, okay, you need to hold, first of all, you need to ground yourself. Secondly, you have to be protecting your space. You can ask Angel Michael to do that for you. And don't leave an empty space for any other entity to enter your space. I think that will hold. So a shaman yes you're right in a point that a shaman would be able to remove the entity but in the same time a shaman has to help and educate um the per other people 
how to ground you them their themselves and how to protect their system in order not to leave an empty space for another entity to get in yes indeed i agree with most of what you said <laughs> i have to uh, so tell me about what you don't agree what part well i definitely agree that majority of people are not embodied and and it's essential that we become grounded we need to have a firm anchoring to the earth and if we have that firm anchoring to the earth we can ascend very very high to the to the, the highest realms of spirituality and still have the means to come back we need the anchoring it's vital without that there's no question really of any kind of ascending in a spiritual way that i i fully agree with i don't really work with angels because why would i work with the lesser spirit when i can work directly with god mm -hmm. i don't know these angels agendas they're all mortal you know they're all individual beings they have their own minds have their own egos they live in a different realm to me i couldn't possibly know their agenda i've heard stories of them being you know employed by god things change i don't work with anyone else i will work with god i will work with mother earth that's it really yeah i work with my plant spirits animal spirits that's different but no middlemen or women or eunuchs or whatever i don't work with any other entities just god why would i work with anyone so when else? you say other spirits or animal spirits those are again something else rather than god if you can call well that. for me these animals and plant spirits are expressions of god without their own agenda so why an animal, you... an animal yeah. lives purely but on instinct And when I work with animal spirits, I would let's say let's say I work well. Let's pick a classic shamanic animal to work with. Let's say I work with jaguar spirit. I'm not working with one particular jaguar. I'm working with the over spirit that is jaguar. Now jaguars, like all animals, they live purely on instinct. They don't do ego. There's no pride. There's none of there's no none of these kind of lesser consciousness things. They're not even really mind. It's just they're purely present in the moment. with god with nature with all that is they have their personality in a sense they have their character and when i'm working with jaguar i'm working with that but that to me is a pure expression of, of divine consciousness in the form of jaguar with the nature and the of, of jaguar and it's the same with the plants and the trees they work in that way and why not the to... angels because they have ego they have their own agenda their consciousness is so elevated that they have the individual consciousness and i don't know what their agenda is i can't possibly know for sure other than by hearsay it's not like i could pop round to archangel michael's house have a cup of tea and a cake and a chat i can't have that relationship really i can maybe think i have but i don't know this person maybe he's a nice guy probably is but i don't know i can't yeah but I at just... the end we're working with uh... with the energy of something right so <clears throat> i might not believe in jesus christ but when jesus shows as a guide in the healing or in the process um i'm not working individually with jesus i don't believe in jesus i'm not christian i'm not religion i don't have any religion but i'm working with the consciousness of jesus christ right mm -hmm. so i would say okay we don't need to argue about this but the consciousness of jesus christ the consciousness of an animal spirit the jaguar or hawks or i don't know eagle or angels i think we are just whatever we're doing is just we're using higher realm energies or spirits that are can assist and they're here to assist us or help us um but i get the that's the intention i get that that's the intention and yeah that's that's lovely however things have shifted and i don't believe that all the angels are still in alignment with god and oh. i've i've received information to to say that that's that's not the case i'm not here to slag anyone off i'm not here to put down anyone's belief systems but i choose not to work with angels because i don't know whose side they're on and there's clearly two sides okay so we don't have to 
<clears throat> we don't have to get into this. We can let this slide. Getting back into shamanism, um, something else that I feel is that, or, or the shamanism way of looking at working in different realms, like the higher realm, the middle realm, and under realm. And that's what gets us connected to everything the spirit of wind, the spirit of fire, the spirit of uh, earth or whatever. But something else, I want to know if you also agree with this or not, is that from our childhood, every time we go into a really um, big trauma, a part of our soul fragments. And then eventually, when this this happens, like for instance, when I had my near death experience almost thirty some years ago, the minute I got into a car accident that crashed, my soul left my body, and I felt that I don't remember anything from the accident. And in a split of a second, your soul leaves, right? So when I lose my father in an early age or when I have some traumas like that, a part of our soul will fragment. And then a job of a shaman is <clears throat> to kind of get the whole of the soul, all part that is fragmented, and come into an agreement as an agent to not to convince, maybe convince is not the right word, but to come to an agreement to come back and feeling safe. So then when I get all this fragmented piece of my soul, I feel that wholeness again. It's like suddenly the whole energy comes back. I have more energy. I am able to create and do more things. What do you think about this? I believe that our soul is fragmented on unlimited timelines and unlimited realities in every moment. We are all aspects of the consciousness of God. So in a way, there's only two entities here. There's God and you, or God and me from my perspective, but it's all mm -hmm. the same. And every life that exists is a life of me. So, you know, when we hear people saying, oh yeah, in a past life, I was Adolf Hitler. In a past life, I was Marilyn Monroe. On the one hand, that sounds really cheesy and corny, but on the one hand, we are all everything at all times, everywhere. So yes, our soul is very much fragmented. I mean, those fragments form together in groups, which form together in smaller groups and smaller groups and smaller groups. And then eventually one of those members of that group incarnates in a human body, and there's, you know, 144,000, whatever, the oversoul that's all there is like your team, you know, and they're all fragments. And at the same time I'm living here, I'm also living all of my past lives and all of my future incarnations now. So in that sense, we're all fragmented everywhere. So ideally, the state of unity to attain is when all of me comes together in one consciousness, but then that's God. Are we ever going to get to that point where we are so much one that we are experiencing everything at the same time? Possible. But then if we get that far in our evolution, we lose our individuality, which means God or me doesn't get to experience all of this. So do we really want to bring everything back together? Or do we, are we here to experience? That's one aspect of that. Another aspect you're saying about when we have a traumatic experience and leave the body this is a blessing when you had your car accident and you flew out of your body you did this consciously on some level to avoid the immense amount of pain of the physical body being mashed up and you probably came back into your body after some time when it was like okay i see what's going on there my body looks a bit of a mess but yeah i can handle it i can go back in now and you went back in you didn't really have to be there to deal with the intensity of the trauma. This happens to a lot of people who are experienced like sexual abuse. Many rape victims say, I don't remember what happened. We don't remember what happened because you weren't actually there. You left your body while it was being abused. And then when it was fit, the abuse was finished, you, you felt safe to come back home to your body again. 
this is very common. It's helpful for us to relive those memories so that we can re-experience them and know what happened. Because ultimately what we're here for is to experience. We are aspects of God, I'm using that word again, to experience itself. Because in the singularity, in the oneness, when God is everything and nothing, there's no experience. In order for there to be love, well, love can only exist if there is a lover and a beloved. So there has to be a duality. That's the purpose of this duality, dualistic universe. So, yes, it's very useful to overcome these traumatic experiences, you know, but at the same time, they are there as part of the wider experience of God. And we are, in a way, serving the oneness by having these traumatic experiences, as horrible as they are. It's difficult, though, because it is really horrible. And people really want and need help to overcome these things. And, you know, we have kind of taken this career path of helping people compassionately to be able to deal with the unpleasantness of existence. And that's really what we do, you and I. When we boil it down to its essence, we're helping people to overcome the unpleasantness of existence. I need to write that down. That's a really good line. But that's our work. <laughs> And whether we do that by giving someone a balm as like a gentle healing or whether we do that by wrenching an entity out of somebody's chest or teaching them how to do it for themselves. If it's coming from a place of love and compassion and wanting to serve the divine, the divine in that person and the divine overall, I think it's good work. And I really honor you for doing that work and because it's important. We need it. The world needs it. Thank you, Gabaz. Now I want to get back to, um, I don't know if you had this conversation last time or not, but um, in one of my trance states or when I, when I left my body, which that has remained into my memories, is that I was able to see many different lives and I understood telepathically that because there is no concept of time and space, everything that you're seeing, you're seeing it on a screen, is happening right now. It's just when the consciousness switch from one to another, our human mind can understand that, and it just puts everything, it has the whole film from this time, right? But then when I got to this stage that I was able to be here fully conscious and all these different lives are playing at the same time and I'm at this space that there is no um, judgment in the pure state of acceptance and I, and I can just see all these movie screens, whatever my soul has experienced but there is no judgment. You are in full acceptance and seeing all that. But in your body, in your physical or in your emotional or in your essence, you're just feeling so enlightened. Like everything is just so great. <clears throat> and all those traumas that has happened in different lives is not affecting you right now. So is is, and then you come to a part that you know from this space, there is nothing that needs to even heal. Like you feel so whole and complete with the fully acceptance of everything that's happening. And like I'm saying, that when you're seeing your life, it's just like you're watching a movie, and there is no right or wrong or should I let me rewind this let me change this let me see how it would be so all the regret all the anger all the you think you made a mistake and if you would have choose this and you would have chosen that is just so I'm kind of hoping that in um, my teaching I can help everyone else to reach this space and how much easier could it make your daily lives? <laughs> you know that you're in full acceptance of everything that's happening right now. This is the aim, isn't it? This is where we need, well, this is where we're moving to as we evolve to be able to ex accept everything that, that is going on out there 
and 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 how we deal with that in here and in here in calmness and acceptance and joy and love and knowing that it's it's all experience none of it really touches me the soul you know you could burn the body you can stab it with forks and you can drown it in water but nothing really touches me and if we can get to that point that's enlightenment that's that's the goal really and then as you're saying to be able to see all of our lives in this way in this one moment to be con that connected this is the aim this yeah. is the aim if we can do this all the time absolutely well that would make us both unemployed <laughs> <laughs> exactly okay. great but that bring would be it on. listen i was watching uh usho's documentary i don't know a couple of years ago right and you know at the beginning everyone came into that center and it was all moment of silence and maybe some jumping up and down to the music and breath work and all that and then when they start to do the center then um, what was her huh things got a little messy yeah but before that uh, what was her secretary's name shiva or she i think shiva was it something like it wasn't shiva but okay. yes yeah, so like yeah. yeah i know you so she started to say okay now sheila. that we gather like t huh sheila sheila there you go mm. yes you got it she said okay now that we got like 10000 people now meditation is going to be secondary and usho said now you have to create you have to create music or this or that and then all those 10000 people they start doing things they start making clothes and they were sewing and they were building and they were doing all this thing and this is the part that a lot of time i think it doesn't click for people if you get to that higher state of consciousness then you really don't have to do anything and i keep telling everyone look we as creator we have to create is not like oh i'm so enlightened i'm just going to sit here and do nothing is with everything that i create whether i'm creating a course whether i'm creating a youtube channel whether i'm it's all of these creation that's making life more um every time i do this i really believe i am one with the divine and that we are creating together so because you know so often when you tell people well they they get this misconception there is nothing to do there is nowhere to go there is not people think what so do i have to just sit down and do nothing well on the one hand i guess you can sit down and do nothing but after a while that gets boring even for the most enlightened you know uh the nature of the soul is is to be active it's to do but it's not just to do for the sake of doing it's to do for the sake of the divine and if we can engage ourselves in some kind of devotional activity everything we do you know whether we're making a meal for our mother or or our children we're doing it with love what we're doing is infusing this reality with more love and that's what we're here to do so we can do that in so many ways we can do that by planting trees we can do that by making you know stained glass windows we can do that by you know building houses or making clothes or everything we do if it's done infusing divine consciousness into it all of those things make the world a more beautiful a more heavenly place to live and i think that's part of our purpose here part of our service on the earth is to actually make this planet uh, a heavenly one to live on and we can only do that by infusing everything we do with the divine and we have mm -hmm. to be in that space of stillness for long enough to feel that connection and then then we can we can channel that energy through us in order to create love in this world yeah kopal i pin a question for you a question about how you go about to fill a space after removal of entity uh oh lost it uh on negative template 
Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by all of that. I know who this is. This is Andrea. She's a friend of mine. She follows me on my page as well. And I know English isn't her first language, but I, I get most of what you're saying. How do you fill a space after removal of an entity or energy? Well, for me, that's just about everything I'm doing, all the work I'm doing, all the healing, all the energy, all the channeling, all the creating stuff that I do. It's about connecting with the divine masculine, the divine feminine, breathing those energies into me and through me. And if I'm helping someone to remove an entity, I'm helping them to do that, to clear their field. And then what we do is take that to the next stage where we are radiating the energy out from our center through our energy field and out into the space and filling the energy with the divine frequencies. So it's the same process. Everything is it's all the same process, really. It's breathing those energies in through us and breathing them out through us. I'm actually, I'm going to do a little bit of shameless self-promotion here, if I may, Sudi. Sure, go ahead. What, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be teaching a lot of this. I teach this in my Shamanic Energy Healer training course. Uh, but from Monday, I've actually got a free five-day course that will be uh, available over Facebook where you can join a private group where each of the five days you'll have a, a lesson a day, an opportunity to ask questions, and I'll do a two-hour live uh, to answer all your questions and talk about the subject of the day. So if you wanted to find out about that, send me a, a, a DM on my account. Uh, just write the word fundamentals. Uh, and that's the, the title of the course, the fundamentals of shamanic energy healing. And I'll send you all that information of how to register for that free course. We will be talking about that in the course, how to, how to clear our field, how to clear a space using this divine energy, because it's a really important thing to know. A great question. Thank Beautiful. You, so when are you starting again the course? The course begins on Monday. It's, it's, it's coming pretty, Monday. It's, it's coming What's Monday. The, mm -hmm. It's the uh, Monday uh, will be the sixth. So today's okay. the second. So I've got a few days to get ready. Um, okay. The way the course runs is every morning I will post um, a, a lesson in the morning in the in the group, and then you'll have you can do that lesson in your own time. In the afternoon, I will put up a, an AMA post, an Ask Me Anything post. People can ask questions in that post. And then I'll do a live at seven o'clock where I'll answer all the questions. So if you missed the live, then it'll be recorded. It'll all take place within this Facebook group. Um, so you need to register to get into that group, uh, but it's free. So Monday it okay. starts. Uh, but to register, just send me, send me the word fundamentals in my direct feed. Just send me a message. If you've never messaged me before, then you'll get something about um, are there any free courses and click that one. And uh, that'll give you all the information you need. And you can join that. And um, yeah, I'll be sharing all that kind of information. It's important. I think this stuff should have been taught in school. <laughs> and, and it will be, you know, maybe not in, in our, our generation. I don't think my children will get to go to a school where that is taught. But maybe my children's children will get to go to school and be taught energy healing, get taught how to channel the divine, how to clear space, how to, uh, how to meditate, how to you know, do everything with love, how to serve our planet. These would be wonderful things to be taught. You know, school. Gabal, I, I have a feeling by the time that it comes to your children, children, that generation will become so awakened that they're going to be the teachers for the older generation. <laughs> it's already <laughs> happening. Yeah, in some ways, it's already happening. Look at our kids now. They are so much more aware and awakened. So... I think that the children of children of the next generation would be the professors of university who are teaching the older generation like us, you and I will be sitting in those classes learning from the, from the new generation children. Yeah, it's possible. And Just unfortunately, the older generation is often a little bit too stubborn to learn from their kids. But I think we're getting over that hump. Yeah. You know, if we realize if we realize that our children are God, yeah. Yeah. You know, then then we can be a little bit more humble and we can we can learn from our children. Yeah. So did you want to show us something or should I jump into the next question? We got a few more minutes left. Yeah, if there's more questions, let's do that. Uh I was gonna ask you, how do you feel about the psychedelic drugs? Well, I have a lot of experience with psychedelic drugs and plant medicines. And I'm now of the opinion that whilst for the right people, they can be very useful for the wrong people, uh, they can be very dangerous. And I think that more people come away from ayahuasca ceremonies with entities they didn't have when they went. 
because the people who are holding space are not really aware of what's going on on other dimensional layers of reality where these entities live. These entities are generally 5D enti uh, 4D entities, and um, they're parasitic entities that, that want to feed off our emotional energy. And I've seen them in ceremonies hopping from one person to another, and the people holding the space are just not aware of that going on. So I think if you're going to go and work with these psychedelic medicines, work with someone who, who has many years, preferably decades of experience from a good lineage. They know what they're doing. They can see in other realms. Otherwise, you could end up doing yourself more harm than good. That's my feeling. That said, I would say that ayahuasca has been one of my greatest teachers in my life. I've been very lucky that I've worked with people who have a lot of good experience and can hold good space. My teacher in the Amazon is amazing. And uh, yeah, I've learned a lot from working with psychedelics, different ones. Um, mm -hmm. I have a good relationship with these plant medicines, but I'm also very, I'm very conservative with these things. We need to be careful. You can't just go and drink some ayahuasca and think that all your problems are going to go away. It just doesn't work that way. She will show you the door. She can show you what you need to do to heal yourself, but she's not going to do it for you. Yeah. And if you go to a second ceremony, having not done your homework from the first one, you'll probably get quite a heavy slap. So approach with caution and... Yeah, work with people who know what they're doing. So let Don't me re respond to Sepide's question. Mm. First of all, Sepide, when I got diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder, I was in my uh, late 20s. And I'm almost over my fifth, late 50s. Secondly, I was never diagnosed with obesity. I was always very slim and skinny. I don't know where you get that. So... <laughs> So let's move on to um, last question of the day. How do you feel about vaccines and vaccination and how do you see the new wave that, or do you believe we have something coming again? I want to just address the previous question first a little bit, if I may. I'll do it briefly. Yeah. Um, I think some of these sort of psychological diagnoses can be quite dangerous in the sense that if you give someone a label, if you are a person of authority and you give someone a label, you are this, you have this condition, it's a very powerful a spell that can be put on someone. I've seen many situations when doctors have said to, be, to someone, I'm very sorry, but you've got three months left to live. And three months of the day, poof, person's dead. Because we put so much... We give so much power to these authority figures that when they say something like that, we give so much belief and, and, and power to their, their words that, that that becomes a reality. If I say to you, you have obsessive compulsive disorder, I say, oh, okay, I've got this. Nothing I can do about it. Doctor said I've got it. I got to live with this. Obsessive compulsive disorder, in my opinion, I, I really don't want to sound harsh, is a regular choice to behave in a certain way. It's probably a choice that was first made when you were quite young. And it was probably a choice that you made because you needed to prove something to your parents. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing wrong with that at the time. We all need the love of our parents. However, if it was something that started from childhood and you've maintained that behavior all through your life and you're now an adult and you're still behaving like a child, you need to look at that and figure out why you're doing it, what you're trying to get from that. Because there's a reason one would behave in that way, because they want something. There's a need that's not being met. What is that need? How can you address that need in a way that's healthy? Because trying to get that need met in this uh, obsessive compulsive way, it's probably not the healthiest way you can do it. And I'm sure that you can find a way that you can meet your needs in a way that's going to make you feel a lot better. Mm -hmm. Talk about that more. Maybe this. Yeah, right. but... Um... For me, my experience when I got uh, diagnosed with OCD, I, like I said, I was in my late 20s, uh, that made me to start really studying um, OCD. And I got into, that was, a, or that was what opened the door to psychology for me. And I really got deep into psychology and the mindset and la, la, la. And of course, I uh, 
I wouldn't allow later on as I started to know myself more and do soul searching and that stuff. I didn't allow that to stick to me, but that was a, maybe at the time it was a door to take me to a direction to yeah, really great. get get to psychology yeah. and see what's really behind it and how would, uh, and the mindset, especially today, I'm just like really amazed, like how this thinking machine, as I call it, is working. So that's really so amazing. So what you did is you took, you took an observation of your behavior and you said, that's very interesting. I wonder where that comes from. And your entry point to looking at that was psychology, which is not a bad thing. And you studied it. You conquered it. You mastered your mind in that sense, and you became a better person for it. That's excellent. And now you're yeah. in a position where you can help other people do the same, which is yeah. very valuable. That's so let let me ask you my last question. How do you feel about becoming vaccinated? And do you feel that we have another wave coming? Because a lot of people in U.S. are talking about it right now that uh, they're going to send another wave. How do you feel about that? I personally am very unlikely to receive this jab. I can't really say it's a vaccination because I, I don't believe it meets the criteria of being called a vaccination. It doesn't actually prevent you from getting a disease, which is what a vaccine is supposed to do. And it doesn't protect other people from getting it from you if you have it, which is also what a vaccine is supposed to do. It doesn't, I don't feel it's fair to call it a vaccine because it doesn't fit those two criteria. It's a jab. Um, what apparently the jab is supposed to do is if you do get the disease, it makes the symptoms not quite as bad. Okay, well, if you're afraid of the symptoms being really bad and you take the jab and you, because you, you want to, to minimize the possibility of the symptoms, okay, that's a choice. I respect a person for, taking that, for, for making that choice. I know a lot of people who have, have, have had COVID and everyone I know that's had it has gotten over it within a few weeks. It certainly doesn't seem to be as deadly as the media might, might say it is. I mean, apparently Portugal, people are just dying on the streets. So they say on the media, if you, if you don't live in Portugal, I do live in Portugal. I don't know anyone who's had it here actually. Okay. Admittedly, I live in the countryside. It might be a little different in, in the cities. In the city. Um, but my feeling is it's not as bad as the media say it is. The media are always very cautious with these things, let's say, without being too politically antagonistic. And uh, they, they tend to make things a little more scary than they actually are. So I'm not afraid. And yes, there probably will be another wave. I mean, we've had, we have waves of flu every season. And this doesn't seem, from my perspective, to be much different than that. It's, it's, it's similar to a flu virus, apparently. I haven't done any scientific research. I'm, I'm certainly not <laughs> qualified to say anything. It's all just my opinion. But from what I've seen, from what I felt in, in different layers of, of, of existence, it doesn't seem like it's something to worry about so much. Mm. I think at the end, we all have to keep our vibrations high and just be one with the wholeness. Thank you so much, Gabriel. It was a pleasure to see you again. Have lots of fun up there. Thank and you. then hopefully everyone will sign up uh, on your free webinar. And uh, we will be we keep in touch. Thank you. It's lovely to see you again. And uh, I really you. enjoyed speaking to you again. And I look forward to another time. Yeah, if people want to check out my, my course last, I think the link on my bio actually is a registration link. So they can click there as well. Uh, okay. But, yeah, send me Beautiful. Yeah. Lovely Have to see you. Have a blessed rest Bless of your life. day. Bye-bye, Gabel. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. See you guys next Thursday. Our lives are going to be every Thursday at 10 a.m. And then also in order for you guys to receive a free gift, you can sign up on my YouTube channel, Sudi Burnett English. Much, lots of love. Bye-bye.